All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Anthony Mitz. I'm currently in my fourth trimester here in the CIT program. And my current courses of study, if you will, are uh, cable installation and also networking. I'd like to take a few minutes and talk to you about uh, fiber optic network cabling to share with you what I've learned uh, thus far in the CIT program uh, regarding this subject, along with some of my own uh, research into this subject. Uh, as you'll see on your table, either on your table or near near where you're sitting, uh, you'll see some kind of examples there, some demonstrations, so you can actually kind of get a you know, up close look at what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, so without further ado, let's dive right in. Talk about what differentiates fiber optic cable from its uh, copper cable counterparts, such as uh, coaxial and twisted pair. All right, so now as you may or may not know, fiber optic medium is very different from the coaxial and the twisted pair uh, medium that we're all probably more familiar with, uh, and we probably even have in our homes right now. Uh, so what exactly is the main difference? Well, for the most part, it all boils down to the data transfer method between the different cables. When it comes to data transfer, there's absolutely no comparison between uh, optical fiber and copper cable. In traditional coaxial and twisted pair cabling, data is transmitted through the cable via electrical signals. Uh, in fiber optic cable, the, that same binary, binary data, those same ones and zeros, are transmitted from one end of the cable to the other via light signals, transferring data at some of the fastest speeds on Earth. So what exactly is this stuff made of? On, on the first table there, you can actually get a good look at the inside of it, uh, the cable composition of it. Uh, at the center of each piece of fiber optic cable is a core. The core is made of extremely fine glass or plastic that readily transmits light. Around the plastic or glass core is the cladding. The cladding plays a very important role. You see light travels in a straight line, but fiber optic cable rarely runs in a straight line. If the cable goes around a corner, the light within it will want to keep going straight. The job of the cladding is to bounce that light back into the center of the core as the network cable goes around corners. Surrounding the cladding are several layers of sheathing, such as plastic and Kevlar, that protect the cladding and the inner glass core. One advantage of fiber optic cabling is the reduced size and weight of the cable. This is invaluable and critical in the avionics industry. Because of its size and weight, as you can tell, it's probably, you, know, you can tell it's a whole lot lighter and, and uh, smaller than the uh, twisted pair and coaxial cable we're probably used to. Uh, but because of its size and weight, it's easier to install, especially in retrofits, because the smaller cable diameters fit comfortably within the layout of existing electrical harnesses and conduits. Another advantage is the fact that cable op cable uh, fiber optic cabling is immune to electromagnetic interference because it doesn't use electricity. Uh, you can run fiber optic cabling right next to a really strong EMI uh, emitter and it's not affected. It also resists eavesdropping. With unshielded twisted pair, or UTP for short, it's possible to capture data that's emanating out of the wire, assuming you have the right equipment. Because fiber optic cabling does not use electricity, there's no easy way to eavesdrop. To capture data, you would have to actually cut the cable and insert a fiber optic tap to capture the light being transmitted through that cable. Fiber optic cabling is also well known for its extremely high data transmission rates. However, just like with all types of cabling, fiber optic cabling has several disadvantages that make it much less widely deployed than copper wire. First disadvantage is the price. Fiber optic cabling is very expensive, much more so than UTP. If you were to compare prices, you'd likely see that fiber optic cabling costs about 10 times as much as UTP wire. When you consider the number of workstations and the servers that you have to connect in a typical network, the cost of using fiber optic cabling can be substantial and add up very quickly. Therefore, you'll typically see fiber optic cabling used mostly for backbone connections. Uh, for example, common practice would be when you need to run cable through multiple floors in a building where fast, high bandwidth data transfers are needed. From there, you would likely use less expensive UTP to connect servers and workstations to network switches. Fiber optic cabling is also considerably more difficult to work with. Because it, uses, because it uses a plastic or, or uh, glass core that is quite fragile, it's not nearly as flexible as twisted pair cable. <clears throat> Attaching connectors to the ends of fiber optic cabling is not easy. You need special training to learn how to polish the end of the cable and 
put a connector on them. You'll find different types of fiber optic cabling, cabling as well, one being single mode and the other being multi mode. Now be aware that the word mode in identifying the two different types of fiber optic cabling simply means ray of light. Single mode cabling transmits data through its central glass or plastic core using a single ray of light. The diameter of this core is very thin, usually between 8 and 10 and a half microns. In comparison, Researchers have estimated a single strand of human hair to be approximately 30 to 100 microns in diameter. A micron is only one millionth of a meter, so as you can tell, that's, that's very thin. Because of the way the cable is constructed and because of its small diameter, the light is forced to stay in the center of the cable. Single mode fiber optic cabling has several advantages. First, it can transmit a very large amount of data. Second, it can do this over extremely long distances. However, single mode fiber requires much tighter tolerance, connectors, and is more susceptible to contamination. Single mode fiber is the type of cable that's used to connect networks in different uh, geographic locations because it can transfer data for kilometers rather than just meters. The second type of fiber optic cabling is called multi-mode. Multi-mode fiber transmits uh, data using multiple rays of light. Each mode is transmitted at a slightly different frequency. By doing this, you can split the channel up and transmit multiple signals at the same time. Multi-mode fiber is much thicker than single mode, typically between 50 and 100 microns in diameter. One of the problems with multi-mode is the fact that when you have this many channels transmitting at the same time on different frequencies, sometimes the light rays go off center from the, from the cable. The cladding that surrounds this inner core is designed so that it reflects the light of each frequency at a different angle. By doing this, it's able to keep the signal in the cable and the data intact. In However, multi-mode cable runs cannot be nearly as long as single-mode runs. The actual length supported depends on how fast you want the data to be transferred. The slower the transfer rate, the longer the cable run can be for the most part. And the faster the transfer rate, the shorter the cable must be. You can't have the best of both worlds. So, for example, say an installation needs to achieve speeds of 100 megabits per second. This is a piece of cake for optical fiber. Uh, and the max cable run can be up to two kilometers. But now say an installation is needed with speeds 10 times that amount. So now let's say you want 1,000 megabits per second or one gigabit per second blazing through a network. That's still a piece of cake for optical fiber, but now the max cable length will be cut in half to about 1,000 meters or one kilometer. And finally, to achieve speeds of 10 gigabits per second, your max cable length will be limited to about 500 meters or half a kilometer. Now all that being said, modern technology has found a way to not only extend fiber optic cable across our entire country, but even our planet, connecting entire continents together at these mind-blown speeds. So now let's take a look at this video showing exactly how that's done. Close your eyes, and in your head, picture the internet. Not your favorite app or website, but what do you think the internet itself looks like? Got a good picture of it? Okay, now open your eyes. Ta-da! The internet. So maybe you're thinking, that's not the internet. The internet is like my Wi-Fi router, or huge data center somewhere, numbers spinning through a tube. And that's all basically true, but the internet is also this massive physical network <coughs> that connects us across the planet a planet whose surface is covered by 71% water. And it turns out a lot of the internet is actually underwater, running through underwater internet cables. Yeah, pretty cool. Hey, I'm Matt. I'm Ella. And we go behind the scenes at Google learning about all the stuff we're curious about. As you can see, we're on a boat. Why are we on a boat, you ask? Well, a little backstory. Over the summer, we met Dan and Lincoln from this YouTube channel, What's Inside. They cut stuff in half, and for a while, they've been trying to get their hands on an underwater internet cable. Well, we thought we might be able to help them out with that. We eventually tracked down Vijay, a fiber optics engineer at Google, that helps you create these cable networks, and we also got extremely lucky. Only a few hours away from our office in New York, one of the companies Google and Vijay work with, TE Subcom, was about to start laying down a new cable system called Monet. Even though there's already about 250 active undersea internet cables that connect major cities and large data centers all over the world, every year we share more information than ever before. So Monet, which will stretch from Florida to Brazil, will add an important new connection between North and South America, and four companies, Intel, 
Algar and Gola Cables, and Google partnered to create it. So of course we looked it up there and met John and Chris and Jeff, who showed us around for the day, and we finally got to get our hands on some up-close underwater internet cable. <laughs> so very close to shore, it looks like this. All right, pops. Didn't you think these cables were gonna be huge? Like, tree trunk huge? I mean, we did. But it turns out, like a lot of things, it's what's inside that counts. And what's inside these cables are extremely tiny strands of glass. Each fiber is approximately the size of a strand of hair. The fiber has to be of exquisitely high quality glass, so no impurities whatsoever. These immaculate little strands, these are the internet. And Vijay told us the way they work is by transmitting your photos, videos, web pages as pulses of light. All these modern cables can carry 100 terabits of traffic. So just to put that in perspective, that's like transmitting this video that you're watching 10 million times. This is the beginning of where a cable is made. So you can see before you a number of rods of fiber. The fibers are coated in colors and organized in pairs because they're bi-directional. So for example, a blue might be sending traffic west and a red sending traffic east. And John told us there could be anywhere from a couple pairs to a dozen pairs in one cable. But typically, each company like Google will just get a single pair. So everything after this that you're going to see is really to protect the fiber. First, there's a small plastic tube that goes over them, and they stuff it with gel to keep the fibers in place. Then, small steel wires are put around that for strength. Copper is then wrapped around all of that to seal everything in. The copper also helps power repeaters, these large bulges in the tube every 50 miles or so, which amplify the light across the thousands and thousands of miles that these cables stretch. After that, everything is covered in a plastic tube, which looks like this. This is the insulator to protect the copper as voltage is applied to it. So now this cable from here out is basically ready to go in very deep water. But where the cable needs to be stronger, like closer to shore or in areas where there's a lot of fishing, they'll add one or two more layers of galvanized steel with this crazy machine. And then for the last step, a spindle of nylon threads covers the cable, and then it's coated in tar. Once it's assembled at the factory, it starts its life on a reel, a little bit of a pan, goes into a tank building. Are these all full right now? Uh, most of them are, not all of them. We need, that one's empty. <laughs> that one's full. So when a ship is being loaded, how many pans would it take to fill it up? I would have to estimate around 100 pans. Whoa! From the tank building, the cable makes its way onto the ship down the aptly named Cable Highway. Then it drops down into the ship's hull where it's coiled in gigantic reels. It takes about a month to load up the ship to leave port, with everybody working around the clock in 12-hour shifts. When the ship finishes loading, then it'll sail down to where it's going to start the project, which is in Boca Raton, Florida. The ship will get as close as it possibly can to the shore, then they'll float cable right up to the beach. Usually, the cable is buried near the shore, so it doesn't get in the way of surfers and swimmers. And a remote-operated plow is dragged behind the ship to bury the cable. We want to get that cable embedded in the seabed. If it's a very soft, gooey seabed, we need to bury it really deep. If it's something that's fairly hard, just a little bit of air will get to another action. The path the cable takes is surveyed out ahead of time so it can run along flat stretches of the ocean floor as much as possible, as well as avoid things like coral reefs, shipwrecks, as well as other bigger challenges. Across the Atlantic, for example, you cross the Mid-Atlantic Bridge. That's an underwater mountain range. So we have to engineer the cable to avoid the steep slope, and then we have to change the armor to ensure that it doesn't abrade over its life while it's laying over that, that rough terrain. So it's like you're actually laying the cable like across a mountain, up a mountain. And yeah, if you can envision like a blimp flying over the country that were laying the cable from the front. To install the Monet cable, there were actually two ships. The first ship started in Brazil and installed the cable up and around, while the second ship, the one that we visited, set sail south from Florida. And then it picked up the cable the other ship had laid and fused it together with the one it was installing to form one long cable. And in case you're wondering, picking a cable off the ocean floor and fusing it together with another chunk of cable is exactly what happens if a cable is damaged, say, from an anchor or a hungry shark. Just kidding about that shark part, it is true that they do occasionally bite them, but they don't really damage them when they do. It's pretty crazy to see the months of work that go into laying just one of these cables. And it's thanks to that work that we have this physical connection between the continents. 
which allows us to see videos and news and photos from anywhere in the world almost instantaneously. And then to realize this is not some new technology. The first transatlantic telegraph cable was actually laid more than 150 years ago. And it looks almost identical to today's cables. The only thing that's really different is the fibers inside. The whole idea of putting something as fragile as glass into a cable that has to be pulled and put under pressure that will crush a heavy steel cylinder, and then have it transmit the amount of data it can, is really kind of mind blowing when you think about it. Thanks for watching, and yep. All right. Well, I'm the only one that. Uh, did not know that that existed. I had no clue. I just assumed that we uh, communicated with the other countries through maybe satellites orbiting. I had no idea that there was actually cables uh, running along the bottom of the uh, ocean. So, uh, so regardless of what kind of cable you're using, chances chances are you're probably uh, chances are you're probably going to have some kind of connector on one or both ends of that cable. So start from uh, on the on the left on the top uh, with coaxial cable. You have your F uh, F connector. You have your B and C connector. And then on the bottom you have your RCA connector to name a few. With twisted pair cable you have your RJ on the on, the, on your right on the top is your RJ45 connector for data and network. And then you have your RJ11 connector for phone and voice. Uh, fiber optic cable is no exception. Let's take a quick look at five different connectors used with fiber optic cabling most of which you will see are very similar in purpose and functionality. First type of connector is called the ST connector. It's used with both single mode and multi-mode fiber optic cabling. The ST connector is a key bayonet type connector, so named because of the white bayonet that you see sticking up out of the connector itself. This is a push and twist connector. To connect it to a fiber optic device, you push it in and give it a twist to lock it in place. Notice that the connector itself is nickel plated and it uses a ceramic ferrule inside the connector. The purpose of this connector is to ensure that you have the cable properly aligned and to prevent light rays from being reflected as they pass through the connector. The, ne uh, the next type of connector is called the SC connector. The SC connector is also used with both single mode and multi mode cable. This is a push on, pull off type of connector and it uses a locking tab to keep the connector plugged in. It also uses a ceramic ferrule down inside that ensures proper alignment and prevents light from being reflected as it passes through the connector. Another commonly used connector is the LC connector. Again, the LC connector can be used with single mode or multi mode fiber optic cabling. It uses a plastic connector with a locking tab. Just like the other connectors, it uses a ceramic ferrule inside that ensures that the connector is lined up properly as it's plugged in and to prevent light from being reflected as it passes through the connector. There's also a connector called the MTRJ connector. As with the other connectors, the MTRJ connector can also be used with single mode or multi mode fiber optic cabling. It's a plastic connector that uses tabs to make sure that the plug is aligned and locked in place properly. And finally, the last fiber optic connector we're going to look at is called the FC connector. The FC, the FC connector is unique among all the others. It's typically only used with single mode fiber optic cabling. Unlike the other connectors, uh, the FC connector is threaded. It's designed to stay securely connected and not pop loose, making it invaluable and ideal for industrial environments where intense vibration is common. Uh, now we just briefly discussed five of the uh, more popular connectors, but be aware that there are many more fiber optic connectors out there used in various applications and configurations. As with copper cabling, there are many different accessories for fiber optic cabling as well, many of them being similar in function to their copper cabling counterpart. Devices such as adapters. Adapters are simply devices that are used to connect to fiber optic connectors. You got adapter panels, which are similar to a patch panel used in copper cable termination. You have attenuators, which are devices that are used to reduce or balance the power of the light transmitted from one device to another device. You have loopback connectors, which are used for testing the transmission capability and receiver sensitivity of the network equipment. You have cleaning kits, which are used for cleaning the ends of the connector, which is essential for achieving the max performance out of a fiber optic cable. And last but not least, you have media converters. These are devices that make it possible to connect two dissimilar media types with each other and switch between the two different network media. For example, with a media converter, you can convert single or multi-mode fiber to copper ethernet wire. You can also convert single or multi-mode fiber to coaxial wire. 
using a media converter. And lastly, you can convert single mode fiber to multi mode fiber all by using a media converter. All right, so in summary, remember that fiber optic cabling uses light instead of electricity to transmit data. Remember that there's two different types of fiber optic cabling. There's single mode, which is uh, used for long distances, and then there's multi mode, which is used for shorter distances. Also remember the five different connectors commonly used with fiber optic cabling. You have the SC connector, the ST connector, the LC, the FC, and the MTRJ connectors. Uh, that concludes my presentation. I hope you learned something new this morning. Thank you for your time.